uh, Roosevelt inaugural for the, or we were going to have the meeting and um, they sent that back to us, which was very gracious. That was $150. So we add that to our October balance. And as of October 31st, our balance is $1,357.92. Great, and I should say, I always forget to press the record button, so right when you started your report, we are video recording this meeting that uh, then we can post online later for people to see. Uh, any questions regarding the treasurer's report? Someone want to make a motion to approve that? I make a motion to approve the amount $1,357.92. All right, Sonia makes a motion. Is there a second? I'll second it. All right, seconded by Larry. All those in favor of the treasurer's report say aye. 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 Many opposed, motion carries. So the next item is our Niagara County lawsuit. Excuse uh, me, M M uh, Paul, yeah. the, the, the recording, this is a recording and video recording. Yeah, yeah. And what about audio? Is audio also being recorded? Yeah. Okay. And how did how does anyone uh, access get a link to that to watch and hear? Well, I posted on our website, and Joe Kissel has also set up a YouTube page of ours that you can if you just type in you know New York Coalition for Open Government, you can find the YouTube page. Good. Thank you. Uh, so next item is Niagara County lawsuit. So as everyone knows, we filed a lawsuit against Niagara County regarding disclosure forms, which we won. So the next step in the case is uh, Mike Higgins, our attorney, had to prepare an order for the judge to sign. That draft order gets sent to Niagara County for them to review and approve the language. So we had some back and forth regarding the language, but I believe as of today, we have an agreed upon order to submit to the judge. Um, so I expect either tomorrow or next week, it'll be uh, sent to the judge for him to sign. And um, then the next step will be now the judge, as part of that order, he's ordering that the disclosure forms we requested be turned over to us. So I assume then, uh, uh, a few weeks from now, we will get the disclosure forms we requested. And uh, since the judge has also declared the Niagara County law they had invalid, I assume the legislature will have to take some action. But once we get the signed order from the judge, I'll make sure it gets sent to the legislature as well. And then uh, we'll go forward from there. And we're sending it to the legislature that you mean the Niagara County legislature we're sending it to. Yeah. And what was that agreed upon uh, order in essence? Well, the order just says that the law that they passed is in violation of FOIL and that, you know, the uh, disclosure forms we requested are ordered to be uh, provided to us. And we, we requested at least five years back from yeah. 2019? Well, so, yeah, I think so. I think we requested as far back as we could go. Good. And, and can we also, because I remember, in the early, I think in the early 90s, it was like they have to keep it for nine years. That's what the archives uh, department was saying, nine years before they uh, destroy it. Well, the local law says five years, and actually, I think the archives law may require less years, truthfully. Whoa. Yeah. Hmm. Um, so we'll have to see. Steve. So they'll send the information to us, but really, we want it to be distributed to the public. Is that something that we'll, they'll, they'll put on their website then? Uh, no, I will distribute it to the news media. I know the Niagara Gazette has already asked me if I've gotten it yet because they want to look at it. So whatever we receive, we'll make an electronic copy of and either post on our website or just email it out as an attachment to the news media uh, for them to have it. Paul? Yeah. 
what about the attorney fees for uh, Mike Higgins, our attorney? Okay. Well, now that the now that the order will be forwarded to the judge, the next one of the next steps also is to uh, submit uh, paperwork regarding the attorney fees. So I, I don't know where Mike is with that. So I'll have to follow up with him, but I'm sure he's working on papers to submit to the judge. I'm not sure the amount of the attorney fees. I'll have to find out. So did they break it up in the settlement first, uh, receiving the FOIL request we made and then the other settlement about attorney fees? Was it broken up? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the judge ruled in our favor regarding the forms, but then the attorney fees are a separate issue. But why didn't we put them together under the one? In well, the we, did, we did ask for them together, but the judge said, I'm just deciding on the disclosure forms. I need additional information in order to decide on the attorney fees. Interesting. That's not uncommon. Um. Anything else on the Niagara County lawsuit? Welcome Maria to the meeting. Yeah, I was having trouble getting on my laptop, but I got on my tablet. I was just going to do my phone. Sorry for being late. No problem. Technology sometimes, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so now we move to number four on our agenda, which is legislator Amy Paulin's amendments to the open meetings law. I haven't received any new bills from her. I know she's working on several others. So, so far, the only bills that she has filed is regarding uh, requiring that meeting documents be posted online before the meeting. Uh, right now, the law is kind of you know weak in that it says as best as a local government can, they should post meeting documents. Uh, she's drafted a bill to mandate that meeting documents be posted. Um, and she forwarded uh, her legislation to the New York State Committee on Open Government. Uh, in January, the Committee on Open Government will release a report where they make recommendations regarding legislation. And our hope is, is that they will support uh, Legislator Paulin's amendments to the Open Meetings Law. That would certainly be uh, helpful. So we'll have to wait for their report to come out. Um, so nothing really new to report there. I'm just waiting for her to draft additional uh, bills, which I know she's working on. Any questions on that? Um, so that'll take us to the next item, which was number five, rescheduling our FOIL program. So as you recall, at the end of September, we had a, a program scheduled with Kristen O'Neill from the New York State Committee on Open Government. And uh, it was scheduled at the end of September, we had 115 people sign up, which was great. Uh, a lot of uh, town clerks and city clerks, uh, news reporters, citizens in general. And Kristen O'Neill had to cancel on us, she said, due to personal reasons. Um, so then we went through a whole lot of back and forth to try to schedule a new date. And I was told that, you know, Kristen O'Neill couldn't commit to scheduling a new date. I don't know what her personal issue was. And then when I talked to the executive director, she said she couldn't do it until January. I said, fine. So as far as I know, and funny enough, I followed up with her today. We have a tentative date of January 8th at uh, 10 in the morning. But I went to the New York State Committee and Open Government website just 15 minutes before starting this meeting. And interestingly, I saw on there that they have a FOIL training scheduled for December 3rd. I said, well, now isn't that interesting? <laughs> <laughs> Told we, they couldn't do it until next year. Um, and now they've scheduled one December 3rd. And it looks like it's just one that they've scheduled on their own. It's not being done in conjunction with another group. So I don't know what to, to make of that. I don't know, uh, you know, I guess maybe we'll have two FOIL trainings, which I suppose isn't the end of the world. If they do one December 3rd and if we'll do ours January 8th, I still have the email addresses for the 115 people that signed up for ours. 
Um, but I thought it was a little interesting, a little unusual. They seem to, I don't know, be looking to do one before ours for some reason. Um, so I don't know what that's all about. I'll try to find out more. Paul? Yes. And can you hear me? This is Kate. Oh, okay. Hi. Hi. I was wondering if it was still too late to sign up for that. I didn't know about it during the sign up time. Is it still uh, too late? I will, before the January 8th, I will certainly uh, like send you the link to it. Oh, thank you. Appreciate sure. it. Uh, and Kate, have you been to our meetings before? Yes, I came last year. Then I oh. had so much school and I couldn't. So. Oh, Leopold, right? Yes, then uh, I graduated. Now I'm back in school. I have more time because I'm at home. So yeah. joining and the group. I, I forget, where do you live again? What town? I'm in North Tonawanda, Niagara okay. County. Gotcha. All right. Uh, Paul? Yes. Paul? Is that um, December 3rd one closed just for their group or is this going to be open? It's posted on their website, so I assume it's for everyone. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if that's to undercut our presentation or if it was just... <laughs> sure sounds like it. <laughs> if it was just something, you know, they didn't think about, I don't know. What time was that going to be? Uh, I can't recall the time, but it's on their website. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Uh, like I say, if we end up doing one in December, if they do one in December and we do ours in January, I suppose it's not the end of the world. So the more people that get information, the better. But you know, you've had conversation with her in the past and, and you t told us how those dates were going. She didn't say anything then to you. I would have thought she would have said, hey, you know what? I'm busy because you know what? We're planning our own. No. You find it just by accident. Yeah, I think this is a new training that wasn't originally scheduled. Hey, so, do we do we have a relationship with any of the members, Paul? Uh, I have developed a relationship with the board chair, and I think it's a good relationship. And uh, I've reached out to her, you know, asking her what this is all about. So I'll uh -huh. see what I can find out. Was she giving in, in uh, when you asking her what this is all about? I haven't, she, I haven't gotten a response yet. I just sent her an email a couple minutes ago. You know, this is, this is very disheartening. I mean, this new committee, that's an understatement, disheartening. <laughs> well, we're being video recorded, so we'll keep our comments to a minimum and try our best. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, that's where that stands. Next is number six, SUNY Board of Trustees Chancellor appointment. As we've talked about in the past, uh, I reached out to the Government Justice Center, which is an interesting organization in Albany. They file lawsuits regarding uh, open meetings law and freedom of information law. And as you may recall, there was a vacancy for the SUNY Chancellor uh, which oversees the whole state university system. It pays $450,000 a year. And without doing any searching for resumes or interviews, they had a series of closed door meetings and picked a person close to Governor Cuomo for this job. <laughs> and they were very sloppy in how they did their executive session, <laughs> which I think were done incorrectly. Um, so the Government Justice Center was initially resistant to filing a lawsuit, said, look, we're probably not going to overturn the chancellor's appointment, but we may get the court to slap their hands saying they didn't do their executive sessions correctly. Uh, so I persisted with them and said, you know what, sometimes it's worth fighting the fight, even if it's a losing fight, just for the point of the matter. And they agreed. And I was excited that I was working with an attorney of them to start drafting the papers. And then I got contacted that the attorney that was handling the case is being laid off because they have budget issues like a lot of places do now because of COVID and the economy and whatever. So the attorney that was working on the case is no longer there. Uh, so I talked to the executive director and I said, well, where do we stand? Are we still doing this or not? And he said, let me see how far he got. I'll get back to you. 
Um, he got back to me and he said, well, he hadn't gotten very far. Um, so I still want to do what he said, but I think at this point, I just want to focus on the executive sessions and not on the appointment. And I said, hey, look, I'll take whatever I can get. If you're willing to file a lawsuit regarding that they did executive sessions wrong and not try to challenge the appointment, which they're probably not going to overturn anyways, that's fine with me. So as far as I know, they're working on doing a lawsuit regarding violations of executive sessions. Good. Um, I'll have to follow up with them to see where that stands. I don't know if that lawsuit will be filed with us being the plaintiff or someone else being the plaintiff. So I have to follow up with them. So uh, any questions on that? Uh, next, we'll go to number seven, North Tonawanda Niagara reporter contract. I think this is a dead issue now, as Joe kind of mentioned at our last meeting, but in North Tonawanda, they passed a strange resolution to pay the Niagara reporter $4,000 a month to, you know, put information about North Tonawanda in the Four or two, Paul. Four, four, 2,000 or 4,000? 2,000, I'm sorry. Yeah, 2, yeah. $2,000 a month, which is very unusual. Uh, I don't think they did it properly. I don't think they solicited other quotes from the other newspapers. Um, but now they've had a whole host of budget problems as well. So as far as I know, and Joe can correct me, I don't think they've done any two page uh, articles in the Niagara Reporter. I think because of their budget constraints and the fact that the uh, executive editor of the uh, paper got uh, in trouble legally uh, with a criminal case. I think that may have putting it all on hold. I don't know if Joe has anything to add. Um, not really. That's pretty accurate. I would say uh, this is absolutely on hold because of the budget situation. Uh, you know, after years of not raising taxes, they've now had to raise them like 7%. And uh, yeah, I don't think the political will is there anymore to dish out 2000 a month to someone who's in legal trouble. Right. So uh, that may take care of itself. Otherwise, I think that could be an interesting lawsuit if they go forward with it. That's an understatement. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, I know I'm behind everything, but what was this person supposed to be doing at the paper? Uh, so the, the city said, you know, I think what happened was the city knew a negative audit was coming out. And most of the, if not all of the, most of the city council members are up for re-election in 2021. And I think they panicked. The reporter was just scathing, saying the city council has neglected their duties of financial management. Uh, this is a mess. Uh, so they said, we have to find some way of getting positive press. And they came up, somebody came up with the idea of let's pay the Niagara reporter $2,000 a month to do a two page insert of all the great things we're doing in North Tonawanda. Uh, and they did that as far as I know, without soliciting proposals from other newspapers. Um, you can't just spend tax dollars, pick somebody without fair competition. Um, but Right after they approved that, uh, an attorney that works for the newspaper got arrested and charged with, uh, or not arrested, I guess a, a civil lawsuit was filed against him for sexually abusing a woman. Alleged. Right, alleged. <laughs> um, so on top of the budget problems and the civil lawsuit, uh, I think they've put that on the back burner. Thank you. That's a hot issue. <laughs> So uh, next item on the agenda is number eight, Mount Vernon. So again, I think last month or around the end of September, uh, we took a look at Mount Vernon, which is a, a city outside of Westchester downstate, has a population of about 65,000 people. And mm -hmm. there was a bad state controller report that came out about their financial situation and lack of transparency. And I thought, well, let me take a look at their website, you know, if things are that bad financially. 
And several of us looked at their website and their website was a disaster. They don't post meeting agendas. They don't post minutes, uh, all kinds of problems. So we issued a report and uh, I was able, you know, I always try to make sure local community groups are aware as best as possible. So I sent copies of it to like the League of Women Voters there. And I found a, a couple community groups online and I sent it to them. And a couple of the community organizations were very interested and they reached out to me and, hey, how can we you know, do more to address this issue? So uh, one guy in particular down there has taken the lead on this and he set up a Zoom call with me and several other community leaders in Mount Vernon and two of the council members. Um, and we talked about our report and how they need to ch make changes uh, so that, that meeting went well, and uh, it got no media coverage, which surprised me. And this community leader says, our city is so bad that people are just immune to it. I mean, uh, it's just story after story. I mean, the chief of police has been arrested. The uh, several city workers have been arrested for submitting fraudulent uh, loans. There's been workers arrested for selling drugs. I mean, just every day, it's just one problem after another. So open government just, you know, does not seem to draw the interest. So he said, I wanted to do a press conference. And he said, you know what, rather than do a press conference, which I think will get no coverage, I'd rather set up a meeting with community leaders and try to get the ball rolling that way. And I said, all right, mm -hmm. you know better than I, I don't live there. Sounds like a good idea to me. So mm -hmm. we had a good Zoom call and uh, I think there'll be some additional follow-up in the future. And uh, hopefully we can help folks down there and prove their government. Two council members were on the call who expressed an interest in uh, raising issues as well. So we'll stay posted and see how things go with that. Anything on that? All right. Number Paul, Paul yeah. did, did you read that report, the audit about Mount Vernon? I did. And in and, 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 and a truncated version, what did it say in essence? Were they lousy with management, financial yeah. management? Actually kind of similar to North Tonawanda. They That's said what I was wondering. The yeah. city council has just dropped the ball. No one's monitoring anything. Uh, they're fighting with the city controller about who's supposed to do what and who's supposed to provide information. And uh, so just a lot of infighting. You know, Paul, I remember, I think it was, I'm pretty sure it was Tyler. He had mentioned the, this coming year, like the 2019, that report, it was going to be bad in the budget we're in a bad situation. It wasn't like we just found out at, uh, during that report. He yeah. already was talking about this. This is a real problem in, in local government. It is. It we, is. Need to, we need to have legislation where we've got to run a, a better ship, a tighter ship in accountability. Yeah, and all we can do is try our best to shine a light on some of these things. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> Uh, so number nine is Erie County COVID-19 transparency. So number four in your agenda packet, uh, the Buffalo News did an interesting article where they said, look, several counties in Western New York provide information about what's happening at nursing homes and other places if a lot of people are testing positive, but Erie County doesn't. Erie County takes the position that uh, we don't think we're allowed to disclose this information. Well, it's not against the law. You're not, as long as you're not disclosing names, you can disclose numbers. Cattaraugus County does it, you know, Chautauqua County does it. Uh, all the other counties surrounding Erie County provide this information, but Erie County doesn't. So we talked, we agreed to send out a press release saying we, we don't support this. And Right at the same time, the Erie County Legislature, several members introduced a resolution saying they want more transparency from the county. So I mentioned uh, the resolution in our press release and that we supported that. Uh, interestingly enough, although the resolution was filed by all Republicans, it passed the legislature unanimously, Democrats and Republicans. And I think part of that was due to us weighing in that uh, usually 
you know, politics gets involved, the Democrats won't support what the Republicans are doing and vice versa. But when we as a nonpartisan group, I think weighed in and said, we support this, I don't know if we can take all the credit, but I think it helped uh, push other people to support it as well. So uh, the Erie County Legislature unanimously passed a resolution calling on the county executive and the health department to provide more information. Unfortunately, the county executive says he's still resistant to doing so, but the health commissioner has informed the legislature that she believes uh, more information should be made available. So we'll have to see if they change their ways. Uh, actually, they had a committee meeting today at the legislature with the health commissioner, and I'm not sure what happened. So there'll probably be an article on tomorrow's Buffalo News about that. So again, all we can do is, you know, draw attention to it, which, you know, has got some support amongst the legislature and we'll see if it's enough pressure to make things change. Related with nursing home on tonight's uh, local news, Channel 2 had, uh, uh, I, Channel 2 with the glasses brown, he was right. interviewing uh, a person who was working in the new fame nursing home maybe some people will be interested in viewing that today uh related to what you just talked about yeah yeah um so um we'll see uh so next item is new business i don't know if anybody has anything new they want to bring up i do maria um i got into an interesting uh thing here uh, actually, it started in August and September. And then when you mentioned about the Erie County doesn't want to give information about the COVID, uh, I was kind of following a few things. It seems like Erie County legislature doesn't want to give out secrets about anything. However, this regard, this is in regards to, um, as you said, shine a light. I think I need a floodlight for this. <laughs> this is regarding election inspectors. And I think it's a very current issue with all the recount of the votes and all that kind of stuff. I simply try to find out, I've been an election inspector before. Okay, where are the classes? Who's, you know, what's available, blah, blah, blah. Uh, they won't give you any election inspection uh, classes. They weren't able to get enough people. I did try to um, go through the cha uh, chain of command. I tried Bill Conrad, who's a councilman. I believe he won the assembly for the 140th district. I tried Lisa Shamiro, who is, Bill Conrad at least did respond with a couple of emails. And basically what he said is, Oh, gee, I don't think election, inspect, uh, election people who are running for office would be allowed to have these election inspector lists. That became one problem. And then Lisa Shamir, I'm still waiting for her to call back. Her, her office person said they're not doing much because of COVID. And I left my number and I'm still waiting. Then there was a couple articles in the paper and the news articles about, I think it was Buffalo News and I think it was also WBN um, in uh, late August, beginning of September that they didn't have enough election inspectors. Uh, to do this. Then I wrote a letter to um, Jeremy Zellner and I wrote a letter to um, Ralph Moore. They're both, re one's Republican and one's Democrat. I'm still waiting. So then I got, then they told me my person is Kevin Hardwick. I tried his office and Susan Gregg uh, did try him for a couple of days. And then she said she finally left the message for Jeremy's, Jeremy Zellner and that's all they could do. So then I said, well, <clears throat> where does the money to come to pay these guys? Because I figured follow the money. And they said, lo and behold, it's the legislature. I said, great, Susan, can I just show up at the legislature and, and speak about this problem? Oh, no, nobody gets to speak at the Erie County, as we know from before. Ooh. So then I went to um, New York State Board of Elections, which, by the way, December 3rd, they're having some Zoom that anybody can get on, but you're not allowed to speak. And that's when they certify the elections. So then it was a Mr. Spano's office, who's the commissioner, and there's about four other commissioners. Um, so then I'm still being stonewalled. And then um, basically, I guess the county pays for Zellner and Moore, and they have a bunch of people. So then when I went to vote, oh, the other problem was the classes. Okay, in order to take the classes, you have to have a secret pin, but you can't get a secret pin because you can call to your blue in the face and nobody will ever give you one. And then when I went to vote, the lady that, one of the ladies that was there doing the temperatures and whatever, um, I said, oh, did you take any classes? Because they were talking about classes. And she goes, oh, no, I took one like five or six years ago. I don't even want to be here. She goes, with this COVID, it makes me so nervous. So um, 
the issue that I have is number one, um, when you're an election inspector, you're supposed to be a Democrat and a Republican at each um, table. And where I went to vote, which is a town hall, um, normally they have eight people, they only had four. So people had to wait in long lines. I realized that you know nationwide people were voting at a lot uh, greater rate. But number one, they don't have election inspectors, they can't get them. And the ones that do try to be an election inspector, they don't give them the information. So I said, well, gee, hmm. Can you tell me when, because you, usually they just would send you a list of classes and you could go like in Amherst, Town Hall, wherever you want to go. But the other issue is um, now, if you do get the secret number, you can go online because you have a user password and you can um, go through 58 pages and educate yourself on how to become an election inspector. No test or anything. So you don't have to be qualified before you'd have to take a test. Oh, and it was like 20 questions. And I think if you only get 15, they would tutor you a little bit and you could retake the test while you were there or whatever. So my big problem with this is um, it's supposed to be very, very one Democrat, one Republican. I don't think that was happening. I think they were glad to get anybody. They couldn't get people and no one is responding to me. So my feelings are hurt. I mean, we have Zellner and Moore. I'm writing them letters. Mr. Conrad, he at least is responding to me saying, gee, Maria, I don't think we're allowed to have this information. He didn't even seem to know that there were um, election um, machines in the very place that he works at. So <laughs> I guess I'm asking for what you guys think we could probably do about this. I think I'm entitled to an election inspector list. I think you should be able to see that Paul Wolf is an, an inspector in Amherst or whatever, and that you're a Democrat or Republican or whatever. And it's not, none of these things are, should be um, under privacy rules. You would know better than me. This is not HIPAA loss. Getting COVID results, I think is a little bit more private, obviously, but. Um, well, I would think you'd probably have to file a FOIL request with the Erie County Board of Elections. Yeah, I, I think I'll try to do that. Then I did, uh, they told me I'd have to do it with the New York State Board of Elections. They did tell me I could sit in on this December 3rd meeting. Well, interesting when you said the December 3rd meeting. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where they certify the elections, but you're not allowed to talk, but you can listen. So I intend to do both. So I am going to do a FOIL because I think we should have a copy of these lists. And I know when I've been election inspectors before, the police department would have a list. So for example, if, um, if I was an election inspector and um, something happened, your family had to get a hold of you or something, they'd go down the list and look and say, oh, Maria, she's over at Hoover Elementary. And they could contact you. I find it really hard to believe that town of town of police town of town of police would not have a list of who's running around in all these places or the town of Amherst or whatever. So do you think I should just try to get the town of town of one to one or get Amherst to compare or how, how would I do that for the foil? Like what would you so, suggest? So when you get a list, what is the point of getting the list? Well, the point of getting a list is to make sure number one, that we don't just have four Democrats or four Republicans because that's against election law. Um, number two, um, it should be done fairly. So if I've taken a class and you haven't taken a class, why should I bother taking a class when you don't have to? No, I don't. And, you, you probably um, won't get a list of who's taken the class. You'll just get a list of who the inspectors are. Right, but even that would be a start. So just do a FOIL and ask for the list, ask for the election inspector list. Yeah. Maria, are, do they have to do t take training classes? Yeah. Okay. Like, like, for example, Sonia, you might, you might say, oh no, I don't take classes. I know Paul Wolf. He just lets me do this all the time. <laughs> what, the, what I'm getting at is New York State Department of State. This became a law where code enforcement people, they have to keep training up and uh, they have to keep abreast of what is amended, what have you. And if they do not follow through, uh, that's bad for them. And well, so yeah, what I'm I, thinking, I think, maybe, maybe they have a list of the dates they gave exams, who took, who didn't take it. And if they didn't take it, what are the consequences? That's what I'm getting right. at. That, that's kind of what I'm getting at. The, the, my main point is this, okay? If all four of us on this screen right now are Democrats or we're all Republicans, whatever, we should not be sitting at a table together. There should be one Democrat, one Republican. Also, there are usually little nuances when you take the classes. It doesn't take rocket scientists, but sometimes there's some things you have to know about affidavits and whatever. It would seem to me that if you, there are changes all the time. And if you're educated in those laws, you'd be better off, you know, being an election inspector. 
But my main problem is that, again, this is another secret list. Nobody can seem to get it. Everybody says, you know, the legislature says, well, they're actually the ones that approve Mr. Zellner and Mr. Um, Moore's um, budget, but they don't even know how much the budget is. So they've got to know how much money they give these guys, right? Because when you when you hire election inspectors, it goes, to, I know when I've done it before, you get your check from the New York State Board of Elections or else you get it from uh, the controller from Erie County. So somebody has to have an account of who they're doing. So I will try to foil that. I just thought maybe if you guys see anything interesting, let me know. Because now it's to the, I've been doing this since August. Just try, just trying to get a list. Maria, you, know, you would think you could just call and say, give me a list. A day or two ago, it was on, on the cable news. Somebody high up in government was saying, Do you know, in the county local election in, uh, department, that is right. so, uh, I can't exact the, the exact words, but in other words is they have so much that they can keep away from you. They have a very powerful and things can be, so to speak, secretive because of the unit they have. And you're explaining this. We're hearing what you're experiencing. And that's just what the person said. They have a very powerful entity, department. Right. They control Mr. a Span lot. Mr. Spano's office, New York State Board of Elections, this person there was kind of, he was kind of okay. Um, he said they have 70 employees and they work hard all year long. And I said, well, can't you even give me last year's list? And he doesn't even know these lists are around, but if I'm gonna get one, I should probably get it from the county. And I said, well, I haven't had a response. We'll keep trying. And it's that kind of, you just keep getting stonewalled. I mean, somebody must have a list from someplace. That's why if so you, you file the FOIL, they'll have to legally acknowledge it and respond. Okay, I will do that. I ju it, just, it, it just seems to me that, um, you know, we FOIL things, we put a, a shine a light on, on things. And that's why I'm so glad to be in, in, in this group because sometimes it's a, you start out with something like this Mount Vernon thing. And then you find out that this is going on and that's going on. And a lot of times I think they're reluctant to give a foil because number one, they don't have it or they don't keep records. Number two, they think it's none of your business. And number three, it is our business. It's our tax dollars that are paying for these things. Yeah. So I will do that and I will keep you guys abreast. Thank you very much for listening to my tirade. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anything else under new business? Paul, I'd like to inquire. I, I don't remember that it was addressed. In North Tonawanda, uh, when they do their planning and zoning monthly meetings, on the very top of the agenda, it will say, due to the COVID-19, parentheses, coronavirus, the meeting will only be open to applicants and it's highlighted in yellow. Is that legal? They can restrict how many people they allow in the room as long as the public has the ability to either watch the video or hear an audio of it at the same time. It, it is- streamed. I'm sorry? It's got to be live streamed either yeah. by video or by audio. And they have to allow at least a minimal amount of people at the, at the meeting? They can exclude everyone from the meeting, but uh -huh. you have to be able to see and hear it. Okay, okay. So, all right. So they can close it off. But here's yeah. the thing. That doesn't jive when, when there's a spe specifically with the zoning board, the uh, applicant he or his attorney consultant will make the case. They hash it through the zoning board asking questions and what have you. And then it comes, when it comes to uh, uh, opening up to the public, anyone for, anyone against, please step up now. How can you step up if you're not allowed into the room? Well, if, it, <laughs> if they don't allow you to speak at every meeting, but if they do, they have no, to- No, you can, you yeah. can. It is, it is in a zoning. I think you, you know this. Hey, Amherst is really- a public hearing. A public hearing, they have to let you speak. If it's just a regular right. meeting, they don't have to. Right. But at a, at a, at a uh, zoning board meeting, the procedure is anyone who's in, in the room, if they are four, they can go to the microphone, express 
their position. If they're against, they express their position. If, if they don't allow you to be there, and you know, this is generally when a person's there, it's because they have a stake in that uh, application. Yeah. If they don't allow you, okay, they don't allow you in there, but if they do not do the process of, well, it's streaming, allow you to speak, I think you're, you are injured because of the fact that you don't have, uh, you're not speaking, taking your position. I think that is, uh, I don't know if you call it illegal, it's definitely wrong. Again, only if it's a public hearing. If it's a public hearing, and they're not allowing people in the room, they have to allow you to be heard either by phone, video, email, some other way. If it's a regular meeting, they don't have to do anything to hear you. Well, well here's, here's the other thing. Uh, I, I'd like to stick with this, what the process is in a zoning board meeting, state requirements, and I will double, I'll double check on that. The point is, even when city of North Tonawanda has their meetings, and, and I don't tune in because you can't hear. Every time I've been in, and I've been in quite several times, that's always a comment, I can't hear. I think it was a budget hearing. People were livid. Yeah. I, I was reading emails. They, were, they attended. I did not attend. They were livid because they had masks over. They couldn't hear. They started 20 minutes late, I believe. It's so much. And... The point is, unless people take an interest, know this, or care about it to speak up, this just keeps going on and on. And this is. Oh, I, have, I have a question. I have a question. Ask about public hearings too. If they have a public hearing, and they decide, okay, people can come in the room and speak, but now all of a sudden, a hundred people show up. Can they just arbitrarily adjourn that till next time, hoping that less people will come, to kind of filter out how many people will be will be. Um, responding? Well, depends on how they do it. Some people will, you know, have a time restriction on how long they allow the public to be heard. Some people will allow it to go on all night long. Um, it really depends, but at a it public, depends on what, Paul? It depends on how they want to do it. Because okay, I remember... So uh, I, I, if they have a public hearing, for example, like they had one for the Brighton pool. So they had a hundred people showing up. So they adjourned it. So the next time they have it, only 50 people show up. Yeah. And then the third time um, something happened and we still, I still don't even know whatever happened. So in other words, I don't want to say censor it, but by diffusing, you know, a few people that don't normally go to a meeting, they go once, they go the second time, the third time, it's like, oh God, they're never going to let us speak. And they try to wear you down. Yeah, you it's, yeah. it's not uncommon for a hearing to be adjourned for some reason because right, right. they want more time or more information. And that, and that's it. They don't have. They can just say we want to adjourn it for more information. Yeah, yeah. Well, Paul, okay. I remember an attorney saying at a public hearing, as long as you are on point, you can take the time you need, however long that is, as long as you are on point. Well, again, different places. Some places have a three minute limit. Some have public hearing, limit. public hearing. You can stay as long as you're on point, as I long as you need. I don't need. think so. I don't think no? so. Okay. I, that's another thing to double check then. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. Sure. Maria, thanks for checking in on things. <laughs> You're welcome, Sonia. I just get annoyed because, you know, people should at least respond and say, we don't have the information. You're not entitled or we're working on it. But to act like this is a big secret, like, like no one knows there's elections in town of Tonawanda. It's like secret, you know? Yeah. Annoys me. Anything else under new business? Oh. Otherwise. Oh, well, yeah. Um, I'd like to ask, on the letter you wrote for town of Lockport, did you get a response from them, Paul? Uh, they they weren't the, providing the information, the agenda? On the Housing Authority, I believe yes. shortly before the meeting, they posted on how people could call in to hear the meeting. Richard's on the phone. I don't know if he has anything to add to it. I'm sorry, what was that? The Housing Authority, when we sent our letter that they weren't telling people how to access the meeting, I think you said the day before or the day of the meeting, they did tell people how they could call in to hear it. 
yeah, they they responded pretty much at the last moment. Yeah. When they get a letter from you, then they get on the ball. <laughs> uh, as time goes by and they, and they don't hear from you, then they go back. Yeah. yeah. The squeaky wheel gets the grease. Yeah. Something to remember. Yeah. All right. Maria, M Maria, are you in the city of Tanawanda? No, the town of Tanawanda. Ah. Secret place. We don't have any elections. We don't know if there's any poll places, but we do stand in line for 31 minutes to vote. All right. So our next meeting then, we, we talked before, a lot of times we skip the month of December, but we decided that our last meeting not to skip December. So our next meeting would be December 10th at 6.30. So I will send out an agenda and meeting link before then. So unless someone doesn't have anything else, if someone wants to make a motion to adjourn. I'll make the motion. Motion to by adjourn. Maria. Is there a second? I'll second it. Second by Sonia. All those in favor of adjourning say aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> motion carries. So we'll see you then December 10th. And if things come up in the meantime, I will certainly communicate with you by email. Thanks for all your hard work, Paul. Well, thank you. Yeah. All right, take care. Yeah. Yeah. Bye. Be safe, have everybody. Have, have a nice Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. <clears throat> Janet, Larry, have a good holiday.